great. We're broadcasting now. Hi, everyone. We're just going to wait a minute as people start joining. Okay, I think we I think we can get started. Um, just make sure. Okay. Um, hi everyone. I'm Ashley Andrakovich. I'm curator of education at Falling Water. Um, thank you for joining us for this month's lecture. In a moment, I'll introduce our speakers. But first, some quick logistical notes. Um, during the lecture, please keep your microphones and your cameras turned off, but feel free to use Zoom's chat function to type your questions, uh, which will field at the end of the presentation. Um, all right, so in 2011, Falling Water celebrated its 75th anniversary, and marking the occasion, uh, there was a gala that featured a performative light and sound intervention at the house that was created by the artist duo Leftwork. Leftwork is Petra Bachmeyer and Sean Galero. And since its founding in 2007, Leftwork's work has been featured at the Denver Art Museum, Art Institute of Chicago, Mass MoCA, and at significant architectural sites such as Falling Water and Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion. Petra Bachmeyer holds an MA from the University of Fine Arts in Hamburg, Germany, and a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Sean Galero, originally from the Bronx, studied art and humanities at Lehman College, City University of New York, and he continued his studies at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in visual communication, art and technology, and performance. Welcome, Petra and Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share and reflect upon 75th anniversary of Falling Water. We would like to share our screen now with everyone to kind of take you on the journey of how we found inspiration and how we approached the 75th anniversary of the building. We are a collaborative team, as mentioned, we started to collaborate in or forming our studio in 2007 and really out of creating installation based new media type of work and in 2010 we received an email inquiry from the Frank Lloyd Wright Preservation here in Chicago asking us to create an, a new media exhibit for the Ruby House. At that time architecture was very new to us and we were actually not familiar with the Ruby House nor Frank Lloyd Wright. So a huge new chapter opened for us, which we fell in love with. For the Ruby House, Protecting Modern, we created a series of intimate gestures and pieces and projections within the private rooms of the building. And we activated the drawers of the bedroom with quotes from the architects. So there were three drawers that we had illuminated with these quotes. And this is one of them where we actually hold this quote pretty dear to us to this day, dealing with space and reality. And we were very inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright's principles of architecture and his inspiration found in nature. He compared um, cantilevered roofs to trees and how trees provide shelter in nature. So kind of drawing that connection between shelter in nature and shelter in structure, we illuminated the ceiling space of the Ruby House. Uh, with an interior, we were very attracted by contract and expanse. 
like how Frank Lloyd Wright creates a drama as he moves through the space. And we wanted to kind of highlight as you move up into the bedroom space, a feeling of expanse. So in this hallway view, we mimic the geometry of the vaulted ceiling. And then with the video, we also created this compression and release with geometry. We also found great inspirations in the window design and uh, we illuminated the window designs in from the outside inside. There was also a video of also bringing nature inside. And so we filmed sort of the silhouette of tree canopies and branches and leaves. And we converged that with the window design as well. Taking inspiration from, again, from Frank Blatt Wright, obviously, uh, with him comparing the material glass to water and the reflectivity of the surface of water to the reflectivity of glass. We filmed reflections on water and illuminated bedroom walls with those visuals to kind of draw that relationship of what the element of glass means to Frank Lloyd Wright. So this is a video snippet of a document, the documentation of the installation. And all of this was presented in 2010 for only one night. <laughs> so, um, after engaging with the Ruby House, we really felt so emboldened by the philosophy of Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, we actually wrote numerous letters to many different architectural sites around the nation, um, sharing this newfound passion that we have for Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. And the boldest one actually found us, and that was the opportunity to engage with Falling Water for the 2011 75th anniversary. We visited the site for the very first time in winter 2008. 11 and that is the first view we had of this iconic structure we have obviously before our trip reviewed many 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 images uh, but it's not the same when you actually see the building in person it's really humbling we were fortunate actually you always think of falling water nestled in the leaves in a way we feel happy we saw it really as a structure in the woods and the architecture stood out very stark within the environment so that was a really it, it left an impression with us and it kind of inspired the whole process so this as soon as we got out of the car and walked up to here and this was just a clear view of the building and the structure from top to bottom and so we, we could just take it all in and, you know, the process started in our studio and looking at the cantilevers and the rectangular forms and the facades, we created a model. And so with that model that took, we worked the whole summer before that project to really map this building and three quarters of the facade of the building. So we used uh, outgoing cantilevers, even the brick stonework and the stairs leading down to the pool. So we wanted to create this sort of top to bottom, even the sort of chimney stack, smoke stack was part of that whole projection mapping. Trying so to understand the architecture and how we relate to it. Um, obviously emboldened by how it is situated on top of a waterfall, unlike any other building in the world, where you would typically look at a waterfall from. So, this building truly engaged us in many ways. Uh, we were drawn to the rectangular shape of the terrace, of the cantilevers. We were drawn to the waterfall and how do we create a narrative. So we spent numerous hours just reviewing different types of content on our little model here in Chicago. 
and we worked on a seven minute choreography of video content that we would then bring to the site. So that's our friend Libio and he's a master mapper of buildings. And here we are with the model and it's really sort of how does form and dynamic animation and filmed material work on such a structure. Here's a sample of how it looks when you take the magic of the image away and the underlying moth involved when you map a building like Falling Water. Falling Water is very unusual. It was the first architectural video mapping project for our studio. And we found the boldest canvas we could imagine because you have so many planes at different levels, like different depth. So you have to be very careful of how you align the entire projection equipment to make it cohesive. So making sure that all the visuals that we will then project are in focus and the brightness of each image or each projection matches up with the other one. So it becomes cohesive. So this image you see is not cohesive. This is when we turn on the projectors and we sort of put it on a a test grid and it's slowly taking form and shape and we see the surfaces that we would illuminate and we see the surfaces that are connected and from which angle are, is the best way to sort of move the image. There's Levy of again sort of mapping and really fine tuning the, the facades of the, of the house. And then, it be, you know, we get, we hone it in, we tone, we, we focus in on sort of which surfaces are the best to project on and really make it pixel perfect so that the lines all line up. And this was a very challenging, intriguing setup to install with where do we place the projectors? Where, what infrastructure do we use? Because as you've been there, the infrastructure is nature. And so we use various modalities of nature to really house these projectors. And thanks to the pretty amazing crew at Falling Water, um, they had the brilliant idea, let's use uh, tree hunting stands, uh, like hunting stands mm -hmm. that you use in, for hunting uh, to kind of mount projectors on. And that was really kind of the genius stroke from the team on site. And they collaborated closely with us, making sure all the equipment gets mounted. And it almost felt like an adventure tour of hauling projectors up a tree, partially up to 30 feet in height. And the team actually also developed these, built the boxes for us to house the equipment so they can remain in the element. Um, so it was actually quite adventurous. It was like uh, two or three nights of installing projectors, making sure they are level. And you know, when we were in our studio in Chicago, you can see the trees drawn on a topographic map, but you're not accounting for that they are at an angle. And all of this is actually impacts how you illuminate evenly a canvas. So Where we, had done, really we had done the math with the projectors, with the lenses, but we had not taken into account the leaning of the trees towards the building. So we had to sort of recalculate some, some of the projections. And the moment when you hit play on a show like this is kind of very nerve wracking. Actually, so, um, as as mentioned, it was our very first video mapping project. So it was an emboldened feeling. We fell in love with Falling Water, the challenge, and uh, wanted to create a meaningful contribution and a dialogue for this festive moment. So we merged uh, film content with motion graphics, always reflecting on the, the movement on site, on the waterfall, on the dynamics of wind blowing through leaves, the birds. So it kind of like, how do you create a, a bold gesture that tributes to such an incredible structure? So we did a lot of filming beforehand on site with the waterfall, with the trees, with the nature elements. And then we combine that with the motion graphics. So you have this sort of, this pairing of 
geometry, motion graphics with the natural organic elements. And we actually have a, a clip uh, that we would like to share with all of you now of, uh, it's basically a two and a half minute documentation of how it was to be at falling water, but of course you cannot capture it on video because once you're actually standing in the middle of um, surrounded by trees and the darkness of the evening, uh, the building and the canvas really stood out and but let's watch it. <laughs> So we failed to mention the last part of that video, which was the celebratory sort of firework moment. And that was specifically um, custom built for Linda, Linda Wagoner, who wanted to celebrate the, the building and how bold and how even its sort of muted colors was colorful in a sense. The fireworks of the show. Yes. So, uh, and the moment of the 75th for that incredible building. For me personally, engaging with falling water was really a one-of-a-kind opportunity. I will never ever forget the experience we had with the architecture and it kind of set the precedence for everything we are, have been doing and continue to do. Um, it's one of the most remarkable sites we have ever seen, honestly. And it set the trajectory for other architectural interventions. We, after Falling Water, we were really curious about how does architecture connect with natural sites and how do architects kind of create this relationship of how we experience nature. And the equivalent building and architect that we came upon during this quest of ours was obviously Mies van der Rohe in Plano, Illinois with his very iconic Farnsworth house. And it, here you see an image of a project we did in 2014. It's titled Insight. And it is a video mapping project that surrounds the entire Farnsworth house. And the projections are actually on the very minimal structure casting through the building and our audience was inside and outside. And, you know, experiencing how contemporary art, like 
digital art can engage with these landmarks and attract a, a new thinking or a new experience really felt emboldening and really kind of enriching. We worked with Sydney Robinson, who is the owner of the Goff House, a nearby house to the Farnsworth House. And Sydney is an incredible historian of architecture. He also taught at Spring Green, Spring, Spring Green Wisconsin. Totally awesome. So he is a total buff in Frank Lloyd Wright's architectural philosophy. And so it was a really meaningful exchange and to come back to his building with the performance by Third Coast Percussion was phenomenal. Yeah, we failed to mention the music composition from the Falling Water Project was actually done by Owen Clayton Condon. And we've worked with him on various projects and his compositions. And I believe we used probably three or four of his original pieces within that. And it varied from very dynamic to more organic to the really bombastic celebratory pieces. Here in Chicago, we worked with Iker Gill on the Marina Tower and a project there. And then in Garfield Park Conservatory in Chicago, designed by Jens Jensen, we created this intervention installation. And last year, uh, after we were in 2014 at Farnsworth, we thought about what's the next architecture that we are really excited to engage with. And that was the Barcelona Pavilion, the German Pavilion in Barcelona. And we used uh, Bosch laser levels to map out the precise architecture. <laughs> and we brought this project uh, not only to Barcelona, but we actually brought it back to the Farnsworth House in fall of last year. and. For this intervention, it was very meaningful to us because we actually focused on the site rather than the architecture. Uh, we created what you see now are like uh, red lines reaching up into the house and those are actually the flood level lines. The house has experienced major flooding through the nearby Fox River. So we wanted to create a relationship that shows you how fragile and also how close the proximity and the connection that the house has with the land. And this pro these, pro these two projects were titled Geometry of Light and they were also in collaboration with Ike Gil um, from Barcelona to Farnsworth, Plano, Illinois. And um, we cannot state enough of how much we love flowing water. So uh, we would love to be open for Q&A now with all of you. And um, I'm sure most of the participants in our call right now have been to the building and know it way more than we do. So we'd be happy to connect and hear what you have to ask. We have received some really great questions. Um, first, um, one question about the projectors. How many projectors were used for the project and what type? Good questions. That was such a while ago. I, I think it was about eight to ten projectors and we matched them. It was like a, a potpourri of projectors uh, because we had to really calculate the distance from projector to the building. So there are different lenses for projectors, different brightnesses. Different brightness. So we had to really create a cohesive image that really flowed well together. So it was, it was a really a mixture, but I believe it was maybe eight to ten and then there was this one special projector hidden in the in the bushes that would project upward. Um, another question from a participant who attended the Sydney Vivid in 2015, and he is curious about how uh, different working with falling water is from something with equally challenging shapes such as the Sydney Opera House. Mm. Ooh. Good question. I mean, it's a very similar premise. It's a mapping extraordinary structure with video content and creating meaningful engagement with these icons of architecture. And, you know, we have always had a, off the falling water, we obviously had an eye on the Sydney Opera House, but we felt very kind of 
we were really drawn to modernism here in the United States. So it became for us an, a journey of modernism within the US. So, and we saw what other people were doing at the Sydney Opera House and we're like, people have done it. So it's really phenomenal what has been done, so. Um, one of our visitors would like to know what was the most challenging aspect of working at Falling Water and what was the solution implemented? Oh, challenging. I think it was technology, like um, power. power, cable management, where would you, you know, run everything? And thankfully, we worked with Leeview on that. So we created all technical writers where things would live. And then the crew at Falling Water was just phenomenal and sort of placement and sort of brainstorming. So it was a really sort of organic process, but we tried to get as much you know, detail down as possible here in Chicago. And then once we were on site, you know, solve problems. But it was really projector placement and sort of um, also dealing with nature, you, the elements. You never know what would happen. The first night we were there was fog. And that really, you know, you could see in one of the images, it, it, you could see the light go through the, the fog and that could also damage the projectors. Someone else had asked us a connected question, which is how did you get the electricity to all of the projectors? And that's oh, a crude question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we were given access. I mean, like before you go there, you ha we had to provide a full uh, electrical plan of how much power we actually need, how many amps, how many sockets. And then uh, the crew on site was incredible. I mean, they know how to work creatively and in tune with the landscape and uh, the way how we were running cables from yes. the outlet was like using twigs very intelligently. Yeah, along so the, the bridge, the footbridge, you know, there's those the pipe and instead of, you know, attaching clamps, they would put just wood twigs in them and then that would hold the cables running through. So it was a really procure from the environment and like really solve from what you have there. It's very interesting, very, a lot of fun. Organic projection mapping. <laughs> um, another good question. Your installations are rather short lived for the amount of time that you put into them and why? I think that was part of our journey. You know, part of our studio in the beginning was this ephemeral quality. Now we're evolving into more permanent object based sort of artwork. And, but that still has that ephemeral feeling. But we sort of, you know, started out as performance artists. And so when you have that fleeting moment, you have that, that time-based moment and that translated into the projection work. And so we felt so, so accustomed to transforming a place and then transforming it back. So it was sort of, you know, taking a, a site or a location and creating something and then we're reverting it back to its original state. It's also part of the medium, you know, when you work with video and projections, it's uh, permanence is very, <laughs> very, very difficult. difficult. Um, can you talk about how coming from an urban environment frames perspectives and solutions to nature based architecture? Mm. I mean, that's actually the dialogue that interests us quite a bit. Like how does urban development connect to, to the environment and how can we, how do architects create this bridge of how we learn from nature and how we can kind of be more, so create a sustainable future eventually. I mean, I feel like looking at Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture, he was really, um, light years ahead of his time. So there's a lot to learn from how he set the sample of creating within, from a site, like he worked with local craftsmen and he gathered materials from the nearby locations. So, you know, there's a lot to learn of how he built structure. And how in our own work, it's really kind of like this connection of how do we take inspiration from nature and how do we express it? Um, we are obviously drawn to the geometry that Frank Lloyd Wright also found in nature. 
I don't know if that goes deep enough, but <laughs> happy to elaborate another time. Um, so this question is about how long it took to, for the full process. How long did the process take from initial conception, design, and implementation? Um, well, that's a two-part question, but I'll ask that part first. Probably a year, less than a year. Eight, eight, to eight nine months. Yeah, I mean, this was our first mapping project. And we wanted to sort of also, we also had to learn more about the building and more about the architecture um, and also the technology and how to, to implement the, the whole process. So it took quite a bit and, you know, to create various chapters and to create a seven, eight minute video to be projected onto an iconic structure. You, know, you, you want to really slow cook it so that you know what you're projecting and that all the chapters work cohesively and that you have a various dynamics happening, whether it's the, the motion graphics to the natural elements. So about eight months, I'd say. Yeah, I think intensively we were, when we showed you the image of us sitting in the studio with the model, I think that was about like a two month process of understanding how content lives on such a building and kind of slowly building a show that we can feel good about and bring to the sites. I mean, it was very exciting to actually, for us to, when we had to go from the team on site to the, the, store, the show has to start, it was really kind of like one of the moments where you're like, oh my God, I have to press play. So, and then it's very satisfying if it all works out. Uh, the second part of this question is, if you were to return to Falling Water, what would you like to do next? Uh, good question. I think, um, I mean, you mentioned the, the theme of nature, and I think the nature around Falling Water is absolutely stunning. I mean, you walk, you don't see the house immediately, but you walk through this ramble and the trees and the bushes and the smell and the sights and the sounds, and I think that is such a important you know exchange with your visit with your visits and interchange it's like the, from transport a to b it's amazing i think that landscape would be like our inspiration to create work there um so this next question is about the music and collaborating with the musicians how did you engage with the musicians and the musical composition was it a joint project or did the musicians work independently? The music was actually existing music, which was fortunate for us. Uh, we, it was really a, a difficult decision to find the right tone for the building. And we looked through, like we listened through music from that time. We also looked at what, listened into what did Frank Lloyd Wright listen to, for example. <laughs> uh, and we we were we needed something more dynamic. Um, so we actually we went to a concert here in Chicago by Third Coast, and they had played some John Cage and some other um, Third Coast percussion. And they and then there the last piece was by Owen Clayton Condon, and that was um, yeah. an amazing dynamic piece. And we thought immediately that this this is the voice. This is the this is the tone that should sort of resonate with the video. And so he was, an, Owen Clay just opened up his catalog of music and said, please pick and choose. I could remix, I could put things together. And so we were in his studio and he was in our studio. And so it was sort of um, lining up the video with his music and sort of choosing from his catalog, the right sounds and the right sort of feel to the visuals. Um. One person is wondering, on the night of the um, performance, where did the audience view uh, Falling Water from? Where, where were they located? Everyone was free to roam the exterior of the building. And um, good viewings would be on that footbridge. And also kind of, you know, it was amazing from many different perspectives. Even like if you're going to the bird view to the house and you saw how the building is nestled and becomes this lantern in the night. Uh, so there were a lot of different vantage points and the audience was really free to roam. But at some, you know, as it got 
darker, it would grew darker, the building would disappear and all you had were the illuminations of the certain facade elements. And so, you know, during moments in the video, we would have complete blackness, darkness. And so yeah, you were in darkness until the video appeared again. Um, and this is a question coming from Sydney, Australia, where it's 2.30 a.m. Thank you uh, for joining us at 2.30 a.m. Uh, was there a reason why the actual waterfall was not projected on in your falling water light installation or was any filming done from the iconic viewing spot? We did film from the iconic Good. spot and we did film the waterfall and we did project it. So, uh, but we, we used the footage and then we manipulated the footage and integrated Correct. it with motion graphics. So it was kind of a merging between the natural representational image and the abstraction of it. Right, so our first visit was winter and there was the waterfall, but we came back for a second um, testing with the video and that's when we filmed the nature and that was in spring, late spring-ish. And so we were able to sort of film not only sort of uh, trees and water around there um, at the building, but also around falling water as well. Um, more, more questions are coming in. Um, one person is wondering if this presentation has been recorded and yes, it has, we will make it available very soon in the near future on our website. Um, this question is about uh, working in a rural uh, natural setting, working with light at night in natural settings. What impact have you experienced with nocturnal animals? Uh, well, funny story, we had a mouse trip the interior of arm one time and, it came, and the security came down immediately, but I don't know if we have any other nocturnal stories with creatures. I mean, we usually uh, turn the light off in certain hours, so, um, you know, most of these interventions don't go past 11 p.m. And so far. We hope we don't disturb the wildlife not too much. <laughs> so no close encounters with wildlife on our site. Um, this person is a professor at Elizabethtown College where her students um, are designing their own Frank Lloyd Wright inspired projects for the end of the course. And she would like to know, do you have any advice for the students about being inspired by right, but yet true to your own creation. That's a very nice uh, line to walk. Because he's one of the greatest architects as he claims himself to be. And there is so much to learn from. And, you know, I feel like just getting immersed is the first step and really understanding what did this architect mean with what he did it's already you know just getting an understanding and a feeling for it and then taking a step back and reflecting on what that really means to the individual student and what innovations they can come up with based on that immersion i mean that's very enriching um, a few people are wondering what projects you have coming up what have we coming up? Well, we are doing a permanent light installation in a Marcel Breuer building in Atlanta, which we are very excited about. Um, it is going to be installed this fall. Currently, we have a show here in Chicago with Volume Gallery, and it's called Chiaro Oscuro, and it deals with light to dark, also modalities of color and neon and paint. So that's ongoing until the end of summer. And then we have a couple of exhibitions in Switzerland, one opening up in the Design Museum in Zurich that is coming up in October. Also sort of a light shifting room that we're working with. Um, and we actually hope, we're looking forward to come back to the area of falling water. Uh, we are working with the mattress factory in Pittsburgh on a residency program. And we are scheduled to present in winter 2021 
and we will look forward to be back in the area and also to revisit falling water at that time we look forward to having you back at that time um, one more question for you um, what uh, if somebody were looking for your work online where where should they go to see more recordings or things like we saw during this presentation they can go to our website at www.luftwerk.net so there's a and you can also find a way to get in contact with us there so instagram to handles luftwerk so l u f w e r k you should find us great and there's a question that has been asked by multiple people, but I'm not going to put you on the spot to answer it, but instead I'm going to turn it over to everyone who has tuned in to consider. The question that has come up most often in our Q&A section is, what would Frank Lloyd Wright think of the presentation at Falling Water? Um, and we, of course, have no way of knowing, but it certainly is a fun question for each of us to consider. Um, and to think about. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for presenting and answering all of our questions. Thank you again, everyone, uh, for tuning in. The 2011 gala was certainly a wonderful moment in Falling Water's history, made magical by Luftwerk's performance and the rare opportunity for our visitors to see the house at dusk. And we look forward to doing more programming like this once the world is a healthier place in the future. Um, so Falling Water, it's a place that matters to so many people, both locally and around the world. And at this time, Falling Water needs you. So please visit our website today to make a donation to ensure Falling Water's future. And if you have any additional questions that weren't answered, I'm sorry if I didn't get to all of them. There were so many great questions. You may also reach out to us through our website. Um, and we will share a recording of this presentation in the very near future. Um, thanks again, Petra and Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.